So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon one more time. It's our second panel, and the last one before the closing remarks by the Deputy Prime Minister, Ms. Kuneva. Thanks a lot for being so patient and uh, to keep your interest to the topic which uh, we started to discuss today noon time. Uh, we have uh, a newcomer on our panel. This is uh, Minister Diallo, the Minister of Culture, Crafts and Tourism of Mali. Welcome, Mrs. Minister, and thanks a lot for taking your time traveling all over to visit our important conference. On her left side, they were introduced already, partly Bill Richardson, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, also Secretary of Energy, former Governor of New Mexico. And I would like to introduce you an emblematic person for the Israeli diplomacy and Scion, Professor Itamar Rabinovich, who is now in the Tel Aviv University, Professor of Middle Eastern History, but also, as I said, a significant person, personality in the Israeli diplomacy. We, in our panel, will be joined also by Mr. Khan, the director of the UN Counterterrorism Implementation Task Force and the UN Counterterrorism Center. It sounds very uh, influential, uh, Mr. Khan, and uh, we hope that uh, you will benefit to our panel as well. Today in the afternoon, we will discuss education. And all we know that in the modern world, especially with the social media, with the fast exchange of information, it's a huge problem concerning the education. The issue is that uh, the academic science and the practice are getting far every single day. And it's not a problem that the practice is moving with 100 kilometers or 100 miles per hour, and the academic science is moving with 20 miles per hour. The problem is with the huge gap we have between the practice and between the people who stay in the universities and create the science, which very often has nothing to do with the practice. That's why we have four practitioners on our table today. And all we know that without an education, we cannot change the world nowadays. We cannot rely that all those extremism, all those attacks, all those I would say far, far left or far right way of thinking might be overcome. So I would like to invite as a first speaker, a speaker, Professor Rabinovich, a great experienced man from the real practice. Professor, whatever you prefer, you can speak there, you can speak here. Yeah. Okay. It's up to you. Uh, uh. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for, uh, for this very kind introduction. Um, I will try to be brief, there are four of us, and uh, we should leave time and room for discussion. And I would like to address the issue on two, uh, on two tracks. Um, let me begin with, uh, with two quotes. Um, one is from a recent op-ed uh, by Nicholas Christoph, a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, and I quote, one point that does not come up enough in discussions of extremism, we should put more pressure on Saudi Arabia, which is the source of much of this. The roots of Al Qaeda, of Islamic State, and of so much Sunni jihadism lie in the extremist Salafi tradition, which Saudi Arabia has nurtured through its education system and financial support. Where do you think Islamic State gets the idea of beheading people from the Saudi government? Nicholas Christoph. Second is, a day after the, the massacre perpetrated in San Bernardino, California, a headline in an American newspaper, attackers, Islamic study comes into focus. It turns out that the wife, the female member of the couple, went to a school in Pakistan called Al Huda, International Welfare Foundation, a very conservative uh, school, where, according to the press reports, she was being radicalized. Now, I need to, to stress, particularly since I come from, from Israel, that I do not equate extremism or terrorism with Islam. 
It, it, it so happens that many of, of the acts of terror in, in recent times are perpetrated by organizations like Islamic State or by individuals who happen to be Muslim, but there is no, uh, there is no equation. Uh, actually, we have a similar problem in my own country. We just uh, marked uh, a few weeks ago the 20th anniversary of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, our prime minister, 20 years ago, by a religious extremist who was educated in a particular trend or brand of religious education in my country, both in secondary school and in uh, university where he uh, uh, was surrounded by a, a group that was radical, radicalized, and uh, became persuaded that the Oslo Accords that uh, Rabin signed and led, uh, that should have and would have led to an Israeli-Palestinian reconciliation and to the return of practically most of the West Bank to uh, Palestinian hands, ran against the principles of the Jewish religion, because in his brand of, of Judaism, the land became more important than the people. The land became more important to the state. And therefore, a leader like Rabin, who was willing to give away parts of the land, uh, actually was uh, treacherous and, and should be killed in the interests of and in the name of, of religion. So you don't have to be a Muslim. Uh, you can be a, a Christian who, who kills uh, a gynecologists who practice abortion, or it can be a Jewish extremist in, uh, in a West Bank settlement or in another part of Israel who, in the name of religion, kills, maims, and, and engages in, in terrorism. But there is a problem that Nicholas Christoph pointed to, namely that uh, in its uh, competition with uh, Iran, with uh, Shiite Iran, Saudi Arabia, either the state or uh, through individual wealthy individuals and, and foundations, has uh, cultivated a whole network of Islamic schools called madrasas, in which a very strict form of uh, Islam is being taught and uh, propagated. And the transition from being a very conservative, a very strict Muslim, to being an Islamist, to being a, a radical Islamist, to become a jihadist, uh, is, is a road well, uh, well traveled. And, and of course, uh, if we need to deal with uh, the, the manifestations of, of terrorism, uh, it's not enough to, to fight the networks of uh, an organization like Islamic State. It's not enough to uh, eliminate or reduce its territorial base across the two sides of the former Iraqi-Syrian uh, border. But you, you have to, uh, to win or re-win or regain the minds of, of the young people who had been misled and are continuously being misled by affecting the educational system. How do you accomplish that? Uh, how do you deal with both the political level that needs to make the decisions and with the professional educators who need to change the, the curriculum is of course a Herculean task. This is not something that, that can be resolved easily or quickly, but recognizing that the problem is there and, and combating that, that problem uh, is a major task for the whole international community. The second track that, uh, that I want to follow has to do uh, not with uh, religious education or uh, education that is conducive uh, to extremism, but with the absence of education for science and, and technology, uh, for preparing a whole society or a whole new young generation for participating in the knowledge, uh, in the knowledge economy. Secretary Richardson before um, <coughs> spoke, uh, uh, spoke about the uh, uh, effectiveness uh, of a group like Islamic State or other terrorist groups in manipulating technology, in using uh, social media, the internet, the smartphone. Somebody mentioned the PlayStation version 4. Um, they're very good at that. But they're very good at manipulating 
the, the machinery and the equipment created by, by others. They have not mastered the ability that you find in Silicon Valley to innovate, or the ability that you find in China, Korea, Japan, and other countries who, who know how to, uh, to produce at, at a very high level and how to, uh, to develop um, and the equipment that turns you into a, a knowledge society and enables you to participate in the international community successfully, provides the income, the per capita income, uh, for your society uh, to flourish and fight extremism through another way. Because if you look at a country like Egypt, it's almost 90 million people now, in Cairo, there's no housing. People who live in, in, in graveyards, literally, turn cemeteries in Cairo into housing projects. Army officers and police officers who cannot live on a government salary and drive a taxi at night. These people are easy prey for jihadi groups because they are bitter, they see no hope, and they can buy, quote unquote, the message of, of radicalism and a, and a different future. And of course, they are angry at their own government, angry at, quote unquote, the West, for being the West, for supporting uh, the government, and for humiliating their own, their own society. And, and what you need to do is what happened in some Islamic countries like Indonesia and uh, Malaysia that are, quote unquote, Asian tigers who have mastered the, uh, the technology and can participate in the international knowledge economy with, uh, with profit. So this is the second track, the, not the one that has to do with uh, education that is conducive to the adoption of radical or jihadi views, uh, but the one that prepares one for life in the 21st century and prepares one's country and one's economy uh, to be a successful member and competitor in the international uh, community. This is a second huge, huge task that of course, an organization like, like UNESCO uh, can and need to play a, a major role in. And since the Director General came in, I'd like to make one comment regarding your own opening statement uh, earlier today when you described the destruction of these sites in, in Iraq and Syria. Uh, this is, of course, is unacceptable, but it comes from uh, a worldview that has it that the world history begins in the seventh century with the advent of Islam and what preceded it is paganism and cannot be tolerated. And um, in, in a country like Egypt, learn how to, to live side by side in Islamic Egypt and certain pride in the, in the, the glory of uh, Pharaonic Egypt. In, in Islamic state, this is not, this is not, this is not the case. And we have to find a way of helping them to, to learn with the past and to be proud of the past. Because for a country like Iraq and Syria to be put together again, which needs to happen in order for the current tragedy to come to an end, Syrians and Iraqis have to be proud of, of their whole history. Uh, the history doesn't begin in the 7th century or in the 18th century. It begins thousands of years ago. And there's something, a lot to be proud of about being a Syrian and an Iraqi, if you incorporate that glorious uh, civilization that ISIS is trying to, to destroy. So it's not just a, a, a human and cultural tragedy that these assets are, are being destroyed, but it, it needs to be part of the repairing process in which members of these societies become proud of the fact that they are part of a nation that becomes then the basis of a nation state that can be put together again and put an end or at least moderate the tragedy that we are witnessing today in the Middle East and that is being carried to Europe and to other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rabinovich. As I said, uh, you're a real practitioner. So, uh, Maybe later we can take some questions from the, from the audience. Let me give the floor to Ambassador Khan for his remarks. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Madam uh, Director General Irina Bukova 
and also uh, President um, Solomon Passage for this um, very important uh, meeting on violent extremism. Uh, at the outset, um, as I am coming directly from New York and where we are in earnest in developing the Secretary General's uh, global plan of action on violent extremism, let me first uh, recognize the leadership that um, Director General Irina Bukova has been showing in this area of violent extremism. This latest meeting is a demonstration of that, but we've seen that at United Nations headquarters when um, uh, uh, Director General Bukova has come to raise the alarm, if you like, um, uh, at the Security Council uh, on the dangers that violent extremism poses. Um, we heard her loud and clear at the Leaders' Summit that His Excellency President Obama convened in September. Uh, and uh, we, I myself was um, privileged to attend just a few days before the Paris terrorist attacks, a very major conference that uh, Director General Bukova and UNESCO convened with many ministers, as she told us this morning, on the issue of education violent extremism. And we've had the privilege at the United Nations headquarters to work with UNESCO as co-chair in developing the Secretary General's global plan of action, bringing together 38 UN agencies, and we will be rolling that out to the United Nations General Assembly um, early in the new year. Let me, first of all, um, put the issue of violent extremism um, into perspective. Um, taking on from the very important comments that have just been made by Ambassador Rabinovich, um, I think we should recognize that violent extremism, uh, and certainly at the United Nations, we recognize that it has no religion, it has no faith, it has no ethnicity, it has no culture. It is an evil in itself. It does not belong to any faith and religion. In fact, we should recognize that the biggest victims of terrorism today are Arabs and Muslims. By far, the largest numbers of victims of terrorism um, have been in the Arab and Muslim countries. In my own country, in Pakistan, almost every day we find um, children, men, and women being massacred by the Taliban and other fundamentalist groups. So this is a universal challenge. It is not just in the Arab and Muslim world. If it is a part of the problem, it is also a big part of the solution. So it's a universal challenge. Not only that, we should also recognize that violent extremism has affected different eras of humanity at different times. Let us not forget that the United Nations itself 70 years ago, when it was founded, we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the United Nations, was founded as a direct response to another form of violent extremism. And where was that? It was here, in the continent of Europe. And what was that? That was the nefarious violent extremist ideology that was called Nazism, that led to the massacre of millions of people on this continent and other parts of the world. So this phenomenon is an evil that continues to plague humanity during different peer eras and different times of human history. Because of that, we must take a much more comprehensive approach. Today we find that one symptom of, foreign, of, of violent extremism is the phenomenon of foreign terrorist fighters. At the present time, there are, under, by UN estimates, foreign terrorist fighters from almost 117 countries. That tells us that 117 countries are now infected by this virus, the virus of violent extremism. We find foreign terrorist fighters coming from a far afield as Japan, as Brazil, from not just the, the, the Arab and, and African Middle East. And so the response has to be a much, much more nuanced and long-term response. There are no quick fixes to this challenge. How is violent extremism a threat today? It is, ladies and gentlemen, not only a threat to peace and security, not only a threat to sustainable development, not only a threat to human rights, and not only a threat to humanitarian issues. Let me just quickly explain how. In the area of peace and security today, we find that groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram and, and uh, Al-Shabaab and others have an audacious agenda. Their agenda is no less than to seize territory, to seize populations, to seize whole cities. Let us not forget that Mosul, the second largest city of Iraq today, has been under occupation by ISIS for almost two years. 
um, to seize oil resources, to seize other forms of economic assets. So their ambition today is even to challenge the whole order in which the UN is based, the Westphalian state system, where they are challenging the international borders, for example, between Iraq and Syria, when Abu Bakr Baghdadi declared, when he declared his caliphate, that the Pico line, the famous Pico line between Iraq and Syria, was null and void. So it's a direct assault on the United Nations Charter, no less. Secondly, in the area of sustainable development, just in the last uh, couple of months, we at the United Nations have adopted a very audacious sustainable development goal agenda. It is by no accident that the previous Millennium Development Goals, the very places where they were not adopted and implemented, are in the very places which are plagued by terrorism and conflict. And I'll come back to that point. Thirdly, in the area of human rights, what we find are that groups such as ISIS and Boko Haram and others are committing what I call shock and awe human rights abuses. They are uh, targeting minorities, women's, uh, children. They leave nobody unturned. And so it's a direct assault on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted in 1948. In fact, we find that the international human rights machinery has not yet been able to bring to effective justice those people who are perpetrating those human rights abuses, which include, of course, the assault on economic, social, and cultural rights. Fourth, fourthly, in the area of humanitarian uh, 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 the humanitarian field, we find that the, as a result of the actions of violent extremists, today there are hundreds of thousands, even millions of refugees in, and internally displaced human beings who are on the march. We have la latest seen that in Europe, Western Europe, where we find so many people fleeing the violence in Iraq and Syria. So putting this all together, this is a challenge of our time. It affects all four core areas of the work of the United Nations and all four areas of the work of governments. We cannot afford to take a siloed approach. And our Secretary General has made it very clear that certainly in the United Nations, we have to take an, an all-encompassing, all of UN approach. Madam Irina Bukova has also shown that leadership by demonstrating that we have to work together as one UN in responding and as one international community, because only through effective international cooperation can we deal with this challenge. No one country, no matter how powerful, by itself can address this challenge. And so what we are now looking at is a paradigm shift. Since the last 15 years, particularly since the tragedy of 9-11, the focus of the international community has been on the counter countering violent extremism, counter-terrorism, countering radicalization. The whole etiology of counter has been based on the military and security response. Nobody today in their right mind would say that we do not need a military and security response. We absolutely need a military and security response to the security challenge that ISIS and Boko Haram and others present. But that is not enough. We need to take a preventive approach. We need to go upstream to address the drivers of violent extremism, what we might call the root causes. That does not justify or condone in any shape or form the, the, the outcomes of terrorism and violent extremism. But unless we begin to go beyond the ideology of, uh, or the approach of counter to also take a more broader preventive approach, we will continue to address the symptoms. Let me just give you a very concrete example. Since the military campaign against ISIS started in Iraq and Syria uh, by the global coalition, the number of foreign terrorist fighters actually has not diminished. In fact, it has doubled. Last year, there were some 15,000 foreign terrorist fighters. Today, we are confronting 30,000. The number of countries from which they are coming is, has also increased from about 70 to about 119 or so countries. And that tells us that the military and security response, whilst necessary, is also being used ideologically by these groups to recruit more people on their side. And therefore, we need a much more careful and nuanced approach, a preventive approach to addressing this. There is one core constituency that we need to particularly pay attention to, particularly in the context of the subject that we're discussing under this panel, which is the issue of youth. 
Today, there are some 1.8 billion youth in the world in the demographic between 16 and 24 years old. And groups such as ISIS, in their evil, have brilliantly targeted the youth. The youth of today are not the youth of yesterday. They are not the youth of our generation. Why is that? Because the youth of today have the power of the internet. This is the new Molotov cocktail. And we therefore have to recognize that and when you talk about education, it is not just at home, it is not just in the classroom, it is also through this, through this machine that increasingly the youth are being either radicalized or recruited or mobilized. And therefore, we have to look at, when we talk about education, we have to take a much more holistic approach. And we know that UNESCO, in particular, has been leading that awareness campaign on this issue. Because technology is moving very rapidly. And one of the challenges we find when it comes to youth is that many of us, many governments, and yeah, I would say even in all humility, the United Nations, has not effectively organized itself in addressing the issues that youth demand today. Youth today do not want just jobs. They do not just want to be, let's say, addressed by ministries of youth and sport, as many governments have, or ministries of youth and employment, as many governments have. Youth want to be full citizens of their state. They want to be full global citizens. And we therefore must look at youth as a positive asset, not as a problem, not as a challenge. And there is no better tool than education as a force of positive social mobilization to make youth productive, constructive citizens of their societies. If we are not able to achieve that, then we have a huge challenge where even a small percentage of 1.8 billion can pose a huge problem. Just 30,000 foreign terrorist fighters, ladies and gentlemen, now pose a core threat to international peace and security. God forbid if this 30,000 was to become 300,000. So I do not want to be alarmist, but we must look at how this threat is evolving. Three years ago, we were worried about Al-Qaeda, about old men sitting in caves. Today, we are looking at ISIS as a force that is controlling territory and resources. And unless we take a comprehensive preventive approach that addresses the drivers and responds to the needs of youth of today, we may face a much more dangerous challenge in a few years' time. So to conclude, um, what I would like to underline is that this is ultimately an issue also, a challenge for leadership. I just want to recount a very small anecdote about a horrible terrorist attack that occurred a few years ago in Scandinavia, in Norway, when a gentleman called Anders Brevis, not a gentleman really, a terrorist, a horrible terrorist, committed on a nice summer's day a horrible terrorist attack and about 70 young youth were killed on a lovely island in Norway. And the whole of Norway was emotionally um, distraught it's a country that has always enjoyed prosperity, peace, tranquility. And the last thing on a nice summer's day did that country expect that 70 of its youth would be literally mowed down in a matter of a few minutes. And I remember that the Prime Minister of Norway went on television that same evening and addressed his nation. It was extremely emotional. But he called on his people and on his country and on the world, and he said that, he made one basic appeal. He said that Norway would not change. Norway would not be affected by the motivations of one man who intended to destroy the social compact and peace of that society. Norway would continue its course. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a core message to our leaders. Because it's all very easy to say that in response to a terrorist attack, we are going to go and bomb the other side of the world. That's an easy response. The hard response of good leadership is to stay the course, is to bring our societies together, 
to promote tolerance and reconciliation, because the ultimate game and agenda of violent extremists is not just to spill blood on the streets of Paris and Beirut and in my own hometown in Pakistan. It is a much more insidious challenge. It is the challenge of provocation and polarization. That is what they aim to achieve, is to sow divide and discord between and to pursue and to confirm that agenda that Sam Huntington talked about, which is a clash of civilizations. We must repudiate that thesis of a clash of civilizations. And that is what the United Nations is about. That is why the Secretary General of the United Nations, His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon, is going to present in a matter of a few weeks a global plan of action to prevent violent extremism. And that is ultimately a long-term agenda because, as I said earlier, there are no quick fixes. In fact, one of the mistakes that we have made in the international community is to um, respond with a Pavlovian reflex to every terrorist attack that occurs. We must stay the course as the Prime Minister of Norway showed us in terms of the leadership. And we have seen also from Madam Irana Bukova's leadership at the United Nations of how effective leadership is a vital resource for the fight against terrorism. I want to end by quoting His Excellency Mr. Ban Ki-moon um, at the Leaders' Summit at the White House on violent extremism in February of this year when he concluded by saying that we can kill a terrorist with a bullet, but ultimately we kill terrorism by effective policies of good governance, the rule of law, and human rights, and justice. That is what our youth demand, and that is what we at the United Nations and the international community must deliver. Good governance, rule of rights, human rights, and justice. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Super speech. Thanks a lot. And uh, I hope that you understand that social media and fast exchange of information and the modern communications, and you're right about the new generation, because this is a generation with completely new, new visions, completely new needs, completely new thoughts. But I, would, I hope that you would agree with me that also social media give us the excellent opportunity to teach these, these people to influence on the new generation, especially preventing terrorism. And that's the role of the modern education, by the way, not only to write books, not only to present lectures in the universities, but also to work very actively with social media every single minute even, not every single day. So if we agree, and I, I'm pretty sure that it will be the very important role of the United Nations, especially in the future after the management of Ms. Bokova, uh, that the uh, United Nations will put a lot of efforts. And yesterday, there was a new resolution on the internet, uh, which is very positive and very widely accepted by the internet societies all over the world and communities. So if we emphasize on putting efforts on education and explaining how to prevent terrorism on the social media and using social media as a main tool, it would be very helpful. Let's now see the point of view of our dear guest, Her Excellency Minister Diallo, uh, on the African point of view or the point of view of a, another country and another region on that important issue. Please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Marito Bihar. If you don't mind, I've been in the plane for two days, and I would like to do like you, to stand there. OK. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, when I first heard everybody, I was thinking, why am I sitting on this table? <laughs> it's all about uh, um, education. And uh, after hearing all of you, I now understand that there's only a thin line between education and culture uh, toward violent extremism. So um, my intervention would be on um, uh, a different way, if you don't mind. Uh, first of all, please allow me to thank all of you, to thank uh, the president of uh, um, Atlantic Club of Bulgaria and express my gratitude 
to um, the DG, Irina Bokova. And um, I would like to thank all of the organizers for inviting me here today to take part of this uh, very important conference on countering violent extremism. Please also allow me to pay tribute to the noble action that UNESCO is conducting around the world for the protection of cultural heritage threatened by armed conflicts and terrorism. The world begins to realize that the role of UNESCO is even more significant today, more than ever. So um, today you would see that uh, my speech will be like um, a speech from a witness, not from a minister, from a witness. You will understand why. <clears throat> this uh, would have not been possible without the leadership of, uh, its, um, of UNESCO Director General, Mrs. Bokova. Um, can I say it? I call her the most Malian Bulgarian. <laughs> and um, I'm very proud to call her a friend and a sister. Without her leadership, the world wouldn't have realized the significant role that the protection of cultural heritage and diversity play in the stability of our humanity. And I will tell you why. Ladies and gentlemen, Bamako, Mali, my country, like Paris, Tunis, suffered the horrors of terrorism. Like the Bataclan, the Radisson Blue Hotel in Bamako has seen young people, uh, Ambassador were was trying to describe those young people. I was very shocked to see that those two guys, terrorists, were 14 and 16. 14 and 16, and they were weighing between 40 and 50 kilos. Um, so it was shocking for all of us to see those young people deliberately killing innocent people, 22 victims that day. My plane just landed two hours ago in Sofia. I'm 24 hours late for this conference. Please accept my apology. Although, I think that I do have a very good reason. 25 days ago, the world has witnessed the terrorist attack in the Radisson Blue Hotel, another sad example of the violent extremism. But 25 days later, after the attack, I had the extraordinary pleasure yesterday, along with the President of the Republic of Mali, to launch the reopening of the Radisson Blue Hotel only 25 days after the attack. That was our strongest response to the violent extremism. This is to tell you how this is related to the conference topic. Um, while welcoming military actions against extremist groups, I want to recall that it is clearly stated in UNESCO's constitution. Allow me to quote, please. Since war begin in the minds of men, it's in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And this is what everybody has been saying this afternoon. This is to say that the fight against violent extremism is primarily an understanding of the universal principles of our cultures and our ability to recognize it as a base of education and a foundation of peace in the world. Each culture around the world uses its own words to call for peace and invites people to promote culture of peace. Understanding this specificity will help defining the basis of a new agenda 
to fight violent extremism. Ladies and gentlemen, the rhetoric, the terrorist rhetoric, usually build around fear and boasting a fight for an ideology without substance continues to hide the reality behind the attacks against cultural heritage. This is clearly a traffic thinly veiled of cultural properties. Some sources even consider that this trafficking generates seven to 15 billion US dollars. Again, that finances criminal organizations. More than that, there is an intention to destroy people, culture, identities for the purpose of instilling their dark ideology in the mind of young generations. And thanks for your definition, Ambassador Ken. I now know that these people can be called the evil with no faces. Isn't that what you said? Yes. From this, we draw a strong conclusion. Culture is a landmark. And this is your definition, Irena Bukova, without saying it. This is what you've been doing around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the example of Mali is compelling. The example of Mali is also our pride. The example of Mali is a successful and historic partnership with UNESCO. The example of Mali is simply a legendary victory of UNESCO and Mali over violent extremism. Please take that into consideration as you prepare the, uh, uh, for the general um, action plan of the UN. Really, you should take a look at what she did. She did an amazing job. The reconstruction of Timbuktu, mausoleums and libraries, as well as projects supported by the UNESCO, UNESCO Mali Joint Action Plan to rehabilitate the damaged cultural heritage are for us the beginning of reconciliation among communities and the revival of our country. And this was a compelling reason for me to be here today, to show the world, to share with you that example of success. I think Mali was one of the very first countries to be invaded by those so-called jihadists, those evils. They've destroyed Timbuktu. I mean, I'm sure that many of you uh, don't know where Mali is, or maybe haven't even heard about Mali before all those. But I'm 100% sure that 95% of you have heard of Timbuktu. No matter what it is called or defined, some people call it the island of Timbuktu, some people call it the end of the world, but somewhere it's part of the heart of the world. And when that was destroyed, it was history that was destroyed. And uh, this is a common history for the entire world for centuries. And for a country like mine, which is emerging, emerging from a serious crisis, culture constitutes a strong asset for the promotion of intercultural dialogue, as well as for a culture of peace. And this is why we constantly avoid any homogenization of our approach to culture. This is why we have been making efforts to keep valorizing our cultural heritage sites in all their diversity. This approach, we believe, contains the solutions for prevention and conflict management system to facilitate intercultural heritage and dialogue. In this quest to counter violent extremism and protect our cultural heritage, we ask ourselves several questions. How to give confidence to people in a post-conflict period? 
how to revive our economy when our communities are still suffering from the negative impacts of the occupation by extremist groups. And we've been through all that. In Mali, we believe that the reconstruction of our cultural references damaged by the extremist groups is the first breath of hope we should give to our people. You should have seen all these tears of happiness on these faces when these people, these communities in Timbuktu, welcome Irina Bokova in Mali after the reconstruction. They were just lost. And when they saw it, some people just cried. Some people fainted of happiness. She was like somebody sent from heaven. Isn't that what they say? And she say, and you, did I tell you that they have three babies in Timbuktu now called Irina? <laughs> OK, uh, this is, they sent me a letter to let me know that. So I'll, I will copy you. Anyway, um, that is the reason why, long before the signature of the peace and reconciliation agreement in Mali in May and June 2015, we had decided to accelerate the reconstruction of mausoleums in Timbuktu. The term of this current peace agreement obliges us to address and meet the needs of all the population in a way that fosters stabilization and reconciliation. Therefore, and beyond our own effort, it is necessary to ensure that, at last, international community remain mobilized so that the second phase of Mali UNESCO Cultural Heritage Action Plan be achieved. Eight million dollars need are needed for this purpose. Preserving Mali's heritage is the first crucial step in healing the pain and suffering endured by our population during the crisis. Rebuilding this heritage is a way to resist violent extremism. I therefore call for a mobilization to enable resilience to all forms of violent extremism in Mali and elsewhere. At last, ladies and gentlemen, restoring and reviving cultural heritage is to guarantee the transmission of values of peace to younger generations. Safeguarding cultural heritage is to offer new prospects to youth through the creation of jobs and to prevent them from being attracted, from being recruited by violent extremist propaganda. Rehabilitating cultural heritage is to reaffirm the obscurantists that our belief in peace is stronger than their will to destroy. Finally, protecting cultural heritage by setting international standards is to convey to the communities who are the custodian of this heritage. A strong message of our common desire and commitment to make cultural diversity a tool for the promotion of peace and development. At last, please allow me to applaud the initiative Unite for Heritage of the Director General of UNESCO, Mrs. Irina Bokova. This initiative was promoted two times in Timbuktu. I also want to reaffirm that the government of Mali is committed towards a global coalition for the protection of world heritage and cultural diversity. To conclude, please let me thank Dr. Salomon Passi the president of Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, as well as the national authorities for associating me and the Malian government to this reflection, which to me paves the way for a global coalition to counter violent extremism through the protection of culture and the promotion of education. Thank you very much. I hope that I wasn't too emotional. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
you, Mr. Minister, really emotional and very interesting speech. In the return that you called our very famous country fellow and dear country fellow, Mrs. Bokov, as the best Malian Bulgarian, in return, all the Bulgarians in this room, we will address you in the future, my sister. Oh, so okay. from now on, you are really our sister and we are proud to have you Thank here. You very much. Thanks a lot. So a couple of quick remarks by Ambassador Richardson. On um, Ambassador, you can come here, you speak, you can speak from the uh, from the table. We would be really very curious to to know your position on the extremism and uh, uh, especially the United States point of view. And uh, I would be very happy if you can share a couple of remarks about the uh, about the position of one of the candidates, uh, the presidential candidates, especially from the Republican Party, on uh, prohibiting Muslims entering the country and destroying mosques and and all those things which are which at least I never heard in the U.S. election campaign until now. And you would agree maybe with me, please, Ambassador Richardson. Well, thank you, Maxime, and I want to say to the minister that. Uh, I know she apologized several times about being late, but it it was worth uh, listening to your very emotional and positive statement. And I think the world joins uh, you in, in mourning the tragedy in, in, in your country. And you spoke beautifully. And uh, sitting next to my colleague and great Israeli statesman, Idamar Rabinovich, who knows everything about the Middle East and the whole world. And, and I want to also, uh, Maxime, thank you for helping organize this event. And, and Ambassador Khan, you know, I'm very proud to say he went to my graduate school, Fletcher <laughs> School, and he sounded like a presidential candidate there. I was, I was about to stand up and start cheering. <laughs> which, brings me to, uh, which brings me to my remarks. I think everybody here, Itamar and and the minister and ambassador kind of talked about the importance of, of youth, of women, of uh, starting from the bottom up, uh, bringing communities together. And you're all experts on, on that area, and, 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 and I respect that. I, I am going to address the issue of the presidential race. I, I'm going to tell you my biases. I'm a Democrat. I ran for president. I didn't do too well. <laughs> but at the same time, I travel a lot. And I, I'm going to try to explain, because here we're talking about openness, we're talking about heritage, we're talking about inclusiveness. And then you watch uh, debates in the United States and you wonder what is going on in America. And so I want to explain to you uh, what uh, Maxime mentioned, uh, you know, how do you explain a major presidential candidate saying that they're going to close mosques down, that they're going to shut the borders, uh, that they're going to uh, send a message that no immigrants are welcome, when America is a nation of immigrants and has been built on immigrants? Uh, denying the entry of Muslims uh, across the board. And, and I guess the message to all of you here is that this is not America. This is 20 to 25 percent of a Republican electorate that has at least 15 candidates. Yes, maybe it's a majority and it's a very angry group within a segment of a party like what's happening in, in countries like France, the Le Pen, uh, uh, these anti-immigrant forces. And I know here in Bulgaria th there are issues relating to refugees, and I respect that. But, but I think I want to send that message to you that that is not America. And, and as a politician, I can tell you how you get votes out. You don't get votes by rallies. You don't get votes by press. You don't get votes by inflammatory statements. The way you get votes is to bring your base and your supporters to the polls. And there has not been one vote yet. The closest vote is 50 days from now 
in the state of Iowa. And then there's New Hampshire. And then there's South Carolina. And I obviously, you know, you can tell I'm a Democrat, I've endorsed Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, historically, America changes every eight years. Uh, so I don't know the, the result, but I can tell you that if the Republicans nominate somebody with these extremist views, they're going to have very difficult time capturing the center of American politics. So I wanted to say that because I didn't want you to look at me and say, look at that hypocrite talking about uh, you know, openness and democracy when you know, in his own country we see there was a debate last night. I fell asleep. I couldn't watch it. Uh, it came on, I know, late at night here. But, but I, I wanted to say that um, because especially the lumping together of all Muslims, that, that is not a view in the United States that is shared by a, a, a majority by any means. So uh, again, we will uh, hopefully soon conclude this race, but let me just amplify a little bit on on what was said earlier, and I said these in my remarks. Uh, first, our governments have to work together, but we have to break down the ignorance, the barriers between our peoples. Uh, we can't defeat ISIS on the battlefield in the Middle East. We have to defeat them, but we can't do it with just weapons. We have to do it with ideas. We have to prevent them from radicalizing our people, recruiting, inspiring others. That means defeating their ideology. Again, the intervention within local communities. Uh, government partnerships are critical, but it's important that we work closely with civil society, with human rights groups, with religious groups. As Ambassador Khan mentioned, uh, we work with I think UNESCO's biggest contribution here, and, and I'm looking at IRENA because this has become a, a, a great tribute to you, IRENA, not just coming here to your country, but to the solidarity and support you have from so many communities and nations that are assembled here, I think is a tribute to you, is what you're doing with girls, with women. Uh, th those that nurture, those that uh, are right now, if you look at the world, the majority of women, uh, majority of the world is women, and they're the majority that is suffering, that, that have diseases, that are victims of sexual abuse, that are victims across the board. And, and I think it is so important, the work that you're doing at UNESCO, empowering women and empowering women in ways to look not just at issues relating to, to, uh, to medicine, to disease, but also to national security. And this is why I think you've heard so many supporting your, your efforts to, to become Secretary General. But I will conclude with, again, the issue of spiritual leadership in the fight against ISIS. We need moderate Sunni forces, Sunni spiritual leaders to go heart to heart against ISIS and delegitimize de their message. That has to happen. I mean, we can, you know, increase bombardments. Now I know that the United States is very active with aerial bombardments. Uh, we now have France. Uh, we now have uh, Germany, uh, uh, Great Britain. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. It, it's got to be ideas and ideology and unity. And this is why I th the, the message from Africa was so important. Uh, the message from Israel, uh, the message uh, from Ambassador Khan in Pakistan. Look what's happened in Pakistan. This, this is almost a daily occurrence, this kind of terrorism. And, and, and again, 
This is why I think Solomon deserves an enormous amount of credit for what is being discussed here, this conference, which you know is going to be beamed around the world, uh, thanks to Twitter, thanks to Facebook, but social media is also, I heard Ambassador Khan said that was a Molotov cocktail. So, so we have to control that message in a positive way. Uh, I hope to contribute the most by making my, my discourse here the shortest. And Maxim, I see you're getting up. You want me to finish. <laughs> so I will finish. Thank you. Uh, three ambassadors, uh, minister, my sister, thank you very much for your input. Uh, we are getting slowly to the end of our conference today. Uh, we have here in the room already the, our Bulgarian Deputy Prime Minister, Ms. Maglana Kuneva. Uh, I would suggest that we have just like two, three minutes break to rearrange the table, and then I will ask kindly Ms. Kuneva to have a closing speech to our conference. So three minutes break, and then we come back. Thank you very much.